Um, welcome to the second event of, the, of today at the Institute for Government. We had a, uh, what I like to describe as a brunch event with Michael Fallon, um, the Defence Secretary, talking about what was happening in restructuring and defence. And um, I'm now delighted to welcome uh, Lord Brown and Maddingley, John Brown, um, a real friend of the Institute and um, over, over the years. Um, in his uh, valedictory speech as the government's lead NED, he steps down um, at the end of the week and uh, Ian Cheshire will be taking over um, in um, about the about, um, beginning of April uh, in the succession and Ian of course has been, uh, been in NED already. Now John came and talked here in the summer of 2013 um, with a very interesting speech um, um, which addressed many of the issues of the organisation of Whitehall, some quite thought-provoking ideas um, on that, um, some of which he returns to um, um, today in looking at what has been achieved over this Parliament with the increased role of non-executive directors with departmental boards, which I think is one of the most interesting innovations which has happened since 2010 and actually one of the least appreciated. Um, and the experience which... Uh, John Brown and the other very distinguished businessmen um, um, have given and the commitment they've made has been absolutely fascinating to the boards and what, what I found really interesting is when Francis Maud uh, had made the proposal um, there was a lot of resistance from permanent secretaries um, so oh, no 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 very bad idea very bad idea who are the most enthusiastic supporters now permanent secretaries because they see the value of having disinterested shrewd advice based on people who understand big organisations. Because the one thing most ministers don't is understand big organisations because really they've operated um, as running corner shops in many respects. Um, that's what an MP's life is. <laughs> and indeed a shadow spokesman's life is. Um, corner shops, I emphasise, um, with my chairman here. Um, in the, um, but they, they are very different from um, the, what a big organisation. And one of the roles which has been brought by the NEDs has been to that. And that we, with one of my colleagues, attended a briefing talking about management information, I think it must be about two and a half years ago, in the Biz Conference Centre. And what was fascinating is to look around the room uh, at the expertise there, and uh, we tried to work out what the market capitalisation was of the companies represented. It was pretty impressive. And what was also impressive was the nature of the discussion being had at the time. So um, that is enough introduction for me. Um, I, as you can see, um, uh, John has had an accident over the new year, um, but I'm delighted he still come, um, felt able to come and speak today, um, given despite that, because um, I very much look forward to his remarks um, um, on, as I say, his experience as the government's lead non-executive director. Thank you. Uh, Peter, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm appearing as Robocop. It's only temporary, uh, uh, and uh, I believe it will all be sorted out in about four weeks' time, but it's very good to be here. Uh, it's a pleasure always to come here because the quality of work at this institute is uh, every, every year gets better and better, and that's difficult to believe. It's so good so far. I last spoke here, as Peter said, in 2013, three years after my appointment as the government's lead independent director. And I'm going to step down in two days' time, having been a very proud participant in the effort to make government fit for the challenges of the 21st century. Since 2010, non-executive directors have played a more prominent role in governance across Whitehall. We've shared our experiences as leaders of large private sector uh, and not-for-profit organizations and worked with enhanced departmental boards to improve the delivery of policy. Across all political parties and the civil service, I think there is quite a broad agreement that good delivery is at the heart of good policy. But in my experience, progress can be undone as quickly as it can be made. Constant vigilance is required to prevent organizations from reverting to old ways of operating. As we reach the end of this parliament, the challenge for my successor, Ian Cheshire, will be to make sure that the effective delivery of policy remains at the forefront of the political agenda. When I was asked to lead the creation of enhanced, enhanced departmental boards, one senior person, who I knew quite well, told me that the idea was ridiculous and that I was ridiculous for taking it up. But four years later, 
it's clear to me that we've made an important contribution to the way in which government departments operate. So with that in mind, uh, this afternoon I'd like to make four points about the purpose behind enhanced departmental boards, about the success they've had in improving the delivery of policy, about the improvements still to be made, and about the need for deeper reform. Let me begin with the reason why enhanced departmental boards were created. The role of government is evolving. It is becoming an organisation that commissions, manages and delivers a multi-billion pound portfolio of projects and services. And though governments are quick to formulate policy ideas, they have a poor track record when it comes to delivering them. Blair, Brown and now the current administration have all struggled to find ways to turn well-intentioned ideas into well-delivered projects. There's an ongoing debate about whether uh, civil, services, civil servants' purpose is to formulate policy or to deliver it to users. But it seems to me very clear that the role is to do both. Policy and delivery cannot be separated. When there's no plan for how to deliver a policy, it's not a policy at all. And when delivery is poor, the intent of policy <coughs> is lost. The wrong targets or misapplied incentives, for example, can create pressure on time and resources without delivering better quality outcomes. Great delivery and therefore great policy require a capable team, financial support and in particular a clear and agreed purpose. The best businesses excel, I believe, at these things. The new cadre of non-executives were appointed <coughs> not to turn government into a business, but to make government more business-like in its methods in order to improve the way in which policy was delivered. They've offered advice and challenge to ministers and civil servants through their membership of departmental boards and also, very importantly, through informal conversations, the impact of which is very hard to measure but no less significant. Their presence has provided government with more opportunity than ever to draw on the experience and expertise of those who've led and transformed large organisations. Improving the delivery of policy is a broad objective, so it can sound rather intangible. Success is hard to define and, and progress is hard to measure. But by focusing our efforts on a handful <coughs> of clear strategic goals, I think we've successfully de delivered results. And that's my second point this afternoon. In 2011, identi I identified five <coughs> high-level themes to direct the work of the non-executives and the boards. And these were gaining strategic clarity, instilling commercial sense, developing talented people, focusing on results, not processes, <coughs> and getting good and timely management information. Under the banner of these themes, non-executives identified more immediate priorities. In the last two years, they've devoted particular attention to improving the capability of boards and departments, major projects and procurement, and management information. I think the results have been very encouraging across all three of these areas. The capability of boards and departments has greatly improved. Departments have benefited from the oversight of boards that are better structured and more focused. Board members now have a better grasp of their roles and responsibilities, and attendance at meetings has improved significantly since 2011. By focusing on more substantial issues, such as departmental strategy, performance, major projects and risk, boards are mirroring the best business practice. There's also been significant progress in the leadership and management of major projects. I think the response to the Getting a Grip report that I published in 2013 has been positive. The report recommended significant improvements to upfront planning and the ongoing scrutiny of projects 
and as a result, the major projects authority has started to make significant changes. Projects are being assessed at key stages and recommendations can be made to ministers to halt or re redefine projects that are failing. And when it comes to management information, decision making has been enhanced by the introduction of consistent benchmarking across Whitehall. Higher quality management information is giving departments the tools they need to make better decisions, supported by evidence, and to assess the effectiveness of policy. These successes have given credibility to this new model of governing. Early cynicism about our presence has faded, and enhanced departmental boards have now become an essential and established part of governance. But I do think uh, further improvement is needed. And that's my third point. When I was called before the Public Administration Select Committee in July 2012, I gave us two out of 10 for progress. That surprised them. Last year, I scored us six out of 10. When I took on my role, I aspired to get perfection, but I now realize that that was quite unrealistic. The work of government is far more ragged than the work of business, and boards will never reach a perfect 10. I think the limit's probably seven. So six out of 10 isn't bad. But this means that priorities now need to be re-evaluated so that recent reforms are embedded and made irreversible. I think that means focusing on three areas in the years to come. First, engagement with boards at all levels must improve. This is particularly relevant for junior ministers who've had the lowest and poor <coughs> attendance at boards. Junior ministers are an integral part of the delivery process and could also be future leaders of departments. So boards must engage with them effectively to ensure that the benefits of business-like methods filter through the whole department. Second, I think there is more work needed to improve the management of talent. An approach with real teeth will not necessarily mean radical new processes, but it will require a change in attitude from leaders of departments. Many CEOs say that people are their most important asset, which means that they should be spending their most important time assessing and developing those people. But in my experience, <coughs> but in my experience very few CEOs actually do that. The civil service is no different. Senior leaders must spend more and better quality time on encouraging, nurturing, and rewarding talent in their departments. It's critical that the civil service gets this right at the very top, and it must be an important part of the criteria used to evaluate the effectiveness of senior civil servants. There's a long way to go. But from my time as chairman of the Permanent Secretary's Remuneration Committee, I know that how well talent is managed has increasingly become a very important part of Permanent Secretary's appraisal. The third area of focus should be the role played by boards and non-executives in the identification and management of risk. In business, decisions about major projects are made at the highest level, so that risk is properly evaluated right across an organization. The governments have not been good at doing this, and historically, less than a third of major projects were, as a result, probably delivered. They were not a third, were delivered on time and on budget. Departments are now making better use of the expertise and experience of non-executives in the governance of these projects, <coughs> but boards need a more formalized role in this process as well. In particular, projects that reach a certain risk threshold should automatically require approval by boards. More fundamentally, I think the real test of boards will be whether they continue to have an impact on how policy is implemented in the long term. Departmental priorities will change in the next parliament, and it will then become clearer whether there's been a permanent shift in the way that ministers in the civil service interact to deliver policy. But the future must be, more, must be about more than simply embedding the progress we've made. 
future governments need to look at a more fundamental reform of the civil service, my final point this afternoon. Making government more businesslike should be part of a wider mission to transform a 19th century institution into an organization fit for the 21st century. The civil service has been through significant reform many times in its history, and civil servants have been ready to embrace change when necessary. In 1853, Northcote and Trevelyan wrote a report arguing for a more meritocratic, performance-driven civil service with formalized assessment and training processes. These principles still form the backbone of the institution today. Almost 90 years later, when the Second World War broke out, the civil service threw open its doors to academics, business leaders, engineers, and scientists to help guide public policy. <coughs> Though it faced extraordinary pressure, my friend Peter Hennessy describes the period as the high point of achievement in the history of the British civil service. These are just a few examples that show us that major reform has been possible. Today, we still require a civil service driven by meritocracy and openness. But I think we now face the new challenges of a new era the restrictive nature of old departmental structures and the generalist training designed for the challenges of Victorian empire make things difficult. And compared to the era of Northcote and Trevelyan, there is a much smaller margin for error. There is less money, greater transparency, and far more communication with the world outside government. There is greater pressure to get things right first time. This new environment will require ministers and civil service to maintain a razor-sharp focus on talent management, the development of new functional skills, taking collaborative working across department, government departments as the new norm, and constantly striving for improved efficiency. Ministers in particular should play a more active role in developing and questioning the department's plans for delivery. These are, I think, the tests for, of any governance structure in the future. If we fail those tests, the nation, I believe, will be poorer for it. Ladies and gentlemen, I was fortunate to inherit <coughs> some of the foundations of departmental boards from previous administrations, and I've had the privilege of working with some extraordinary people. In particular, Francis Maud's hands-on and determined commitment has made much of this work possible. He deserves credit for his work on the Efficiency and Reform Program and his efforts to improve the skills and accountability of the civil service. So Jeremy Hayward and his predecessor, Gus O'Donnell, have led the civil service through a time of extraordinary change. And the civil service has impressed me with its endurance, professionalism, and dedication to the many and changing tasks at hand. People are wary of large organizations like the civil service reverting to the norm as time passes and people move on. I hope that won't be the case, as an extraordinary amount of human energy has been invested in changing the way Whitehall operates, I believe, for the better. The aspiration to make government admired for its efficiency and innovation is a noble one, and we mustn't take recent progress for granted. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, John, uh, for, for those, those remarks. Lots of thoughts in there. Um, can I just ask you a few points before we open it up? Out to, out to the audience. Um, you make a very interesting suggestion about the role um, of boards in relation to major projects. But at present, we have the system of ministerial direction. That if you're a permanent secretary and think your um, Secretary of State is proposing something um, which isn't value for money or doesn't fulfill the other criteria, it goes back very historically. Um, they can put a ministerial, seek a ministerial direction. In fact, probably none do. Um, 
but because the impact on the relationship. Now, how would this work when you've got a Secretary of State who's determined to do something? You're saying that the, the, the departmental board would have, the, would have a veto, effectively, on what a, a Secretary of State would do. Well, I, I don't think it's going it, to... We're never going to get it to have a veto because I think there's too many constitutional pieces to move around. But to have a very strong influence and to be very clear that would we'll publish its findings, that I think is almost sufficient to change people's minds. Provided that we keep the quality of people up, which I think is really the most important thing in, in the cadre of non-executives. When people know what they're talking about, uh, it tends to make people sit up and think. But would this mean that a, a board, if they had reservations, let's say work, um, 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 the universal credit, something like that, um, would be able to publicly enter a reservation in and saying, we are worried about the practicalities of this? Well, I think you start by doing it privately because mm. you, you, I mean, the point is getting something done rather than making a mess. Mm. Uh, so you do it privately and then you raise the heat. Mm. Uh, and if you really don't like what's going on, you can always resign because everybody as a non-executive director has, has really no vested interest other than doing the right thing. And so they can remove their, their voluntary labor, if you will, uh, very easily, and that means something. Mm. Now, the, one of the other suggestions you made, um, going back to what you, you, you were talking about here in June uh, 2013, was relation to departmental structure. So you were saying then, perhaps the, the, the one, uh, the traditional one, which is now, um, nearly a century old, was outmoded, and we need to think of a, a wholly different structure. What you, you, referred, you referred in your speech to the restrictive nature of old departmental structures. So I'm, uh, I think I'd like to think about this now and reflect, uh, when I reflect on what I've seen and, and what I've said and what other people have said is almost two stages. The first is, let's see if we can get the behavior better. So we need people to work better together. And so, for example, David Sainsbury, made a, a very important uh, proposal, which is pretty well accepted, that we should have a, a universal, if you will, finance function inside government. You know, you, you wouldn't run a, a gigantic corporation with every single subdivision having its own finance director doing its own thing. It's just not possible. So getting a unified standard and getting people to work together is the start. The second is something called, in this uh, parlance of management speak, functional excellence and functional access. It's simply getting the people of like minds, so all the people who are accountants, all the people who are HR people, all the people who do IT, working together across government. It's a step-by-step -step process. When you get that working, it makes the departmental boundaries less important and it gets the right job done in the right place. Obviously, that's a threat for those who believe that the security of departmental boundaries is the only thing to rely upon. But I'd suggest that if the result looks better, people will begin to allow some of that to happen. And I see some of that happening where there is effective uh, activity going across functions. Third point I'd make is you make change by changing people's minds and by, from the very beginning, teaching and training and developing people to think of the civil service and not of a department. Think of the civil service, think of the total impact, train that every single day, make it part of the development program, and then you'll get the right result. You say at the end, um, the kind of, you're, and you, you just said now, your concern to maintain the quality of non-executives. You, know, you were able um, in 2010 to bring in uh, people who are chief executives of large numbers of major countries. I mean, the, the crack I made in introducing you, trying to count up the market capitalization um, of, of, of the companies. I mean, it was a very impressive range of, 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 of companies indeed. Um, and very striking, the expertise and the quality of discussion. Mm. How, I mean, in a sense, and you hint at this at the end of the speech, you have a kind of heroic phase, almost, when you can do that. Isn't there always a danger that that will decline? It, it becomes regularised, it will become more difficult. After all, by definition, most of the chief executives are pretty busy people anyway, running well, their companies. The, the, the bad and good news is that so the chief executives don't last as long as they used to. 
And so it does mean that uh, you do get a bit of a turnover, which Good. means there are new faces appearing. On a more serious point, I, I think there's very few people who would not uh, voluntarily give up time for some form of national service if they live in this country. There's something about contributing to getting something done better that's in the minds of most people who are successful, and actually most people. Uh, and I think you can see some of that in, the, in community activity. So people voluntarily give up time, but they want to be, they want to be respected, and they want to be productive, and they want to see the results of their efforts. Uh, and when they have those conditions, then they come along. Uh, and they come along because other people have come along, uh, much as they would in any walk of life. So long as they are uh, valued, because then, as you rightly say, there's plenty of other things to do, including spending some of the precious time you're giving up for this at home with your family. You know which is usually the trade-off that these people are making. One interesting point you made was on junior ministers. I mean, it's, it's come out in actually quite a lot of the Institute work. We did a very uh, interesting report last year on implementation and looking at various projects and the key role a number of junior ministers had in actually taking forward the projects after they were out of the limelight when the legislation was passed on that. But what about the, I mean, looking at the role of boards, um, I, did you feel, and I, I that, that that Secretaries of State fully understood the contribution. Because after all, for a lot, large extent, both boards and working with successful um, chief executives is not necessarily familiar to them. So the record is mixed. Mm. Uh, it's bound to be, given the backgrounds of people who, who end up as Secretaries of State and Ministers. Uh, some are extraordinarily familiar with this process, having spent time in the, in the public or not-for-profit sector, and they want to engage very quickly, and they get things done. Others move into it. I mean, they, they, they don't quite understand what it's there for, and then perhaps their permanent secretary tries to describe it to them, and the board becomes helpful in one area, and then they eventually work with the Secretary of State. T to me, one of the very important things that, that, is, that is a skill that perhaps you know, people could be not trained for, it's very difficult to train very senior people, but to indicate to them that they might do it a bit better is running, is running meetings. Uh, uh, it sounds very strange, but you know, really good decisions really emanate from good meetings. Uh, it's where everybody feels really uh, ready and really, and really uh, valued to give their opinion in a way which they mean rather than in a way which they want someone to hear. Uh, and uh, getting that environment is really important. And it's so easy to turn it off. It, it really is very easy. I know that because I've made enough mistakes in my life uh, to recognize that when I've turned off a meeting, it's very in turning off and turning on a meeting is something you need to be very careful with. And I think if we could help uh, ministers who are going to go into these big jobs to do that, it would be wonderful. Because you look at uh, some of the, from our point of view, look at some of the more successful ministers, is they're people who know how to run a meeting well and really show that they've valued it. The other factor, and it's a, is, were you worried in, in the sense that the permanent secretaries were always trying to capture the NEDs around departments, having initially been sceptical. I mean, the quote you gave at the beginning of the person saying you're completely mad and all that stuff. But at the departmental level, the permanent secretary is recognising this is for real, it's permanent. And, it, it, and also seeing the point you made about Secretary of State, embracing them and in danger of neutralising them. Well, I think when we started, there were quite a few permanent secretaries who were really worried about this. Uh, because it didn't fit into the established pattern of activity. So who was speaking to who, and where would advice go, mm. and who would influence who, was very destabilizing, and people who are very smart and they're destabilized do something about it, so they react. Uh, so, but as time's gone on, we've been there, and permanent secretaries have changed. And so we're part of the established process, so it's people haven't been trying to kill it, they've been trying to work with it. 
and recognize that it's not a matter of you know, getting people close to you so they're not close to somebody else. It's, it's not a matter of gaining unique constituencies. It's a matter of having a balanced approach with people, again, who don't actually have a particularly, uh, they don't owe their existence to a permanent secretary, actually even to a minister. So they're really quite independent and, and they don't need to you know, be aligned, as it were. They can be non-aligned. But one, in, but one interesting thing happened since 2010 is, th is the growing responsibilities <coughs> given to, particularly the lead neds in departments. I mean, you mentioned you're yes. chairing the remuneration board, but you're, you're also involved in appointments too. And now in the new appointments process and also the appraisal process, but let's start with the appraisal one, that consciously there's an attempt that the lead ned should be one of the people who appraises permanent secretaries. Well, correct. And, and, and indeed more involved now in appointments as well. It's because they are independent. I think that's really important. Uh, for example, when a permanent secretary is appraised, there are plenty of inputs. Inputs from the Treasury about financial stewardship, inputs from the staff on 360 degree feedback, inputs from the cabinet secretary, inputs from ministers. So there's a lot of documents. And actually, if you look at all the documents, uh, by the time you have all the permanent secretaries, you can't actually carry the dossier. It's gigantic. Uh, and it's hard copy because it's so private. So, so you have this big thing. And so what we've concluded is actually the lead independent director should take all these inputs, apply her or his own evaluation, but to be the person to bring together a balanced judgment from all inputs so that then the committee can then make its decision on a more, uh, I mean, it's just sort of a standardized, balanced approach to inputs. So that's very important for the lead independent director to do. Uh, and it's something which, which I think is a, a great advance. It, it, again, takes things out of emotion and puts things very much into a more independent frame. Now, one, you have again a slight warning at the end of um, uh, what might happen in the future. Um, what should be the benchmarks we on the outside look for for um, further progress with non executive directors or a slipping back, as you describe it, the danger of reverting to the norm? What, what, what well, should we watch for? I, um, at the end of my speech, I've actually laid out, uh, in my view, the tests yeah. uh, for uh, whether this is going forward or backwards. Uh, and they start with, I won't go through the four mm. tests, you can mm. look at it again. But in my mind, the single most important test is the, very, the most modern and most effective approach to talent management there possibly is. Uh, I think that is absolutely critical. And I'm reminded, if I go back in, in enough history, when I was, uh, when I was a, a senior manager, not uh, the CEO of BP, but the next level down, we always looked at the civil service and said, there are some pretty good ideas on how they develop and train their top people. There's been quite a long time since that time where people absolutely wouldn't look at the civil service. They'd look elsewhere. I think the civil service being completely about great people at all levels doing great things, needs to get back into that position. And I think that's a big test. I think the other test is trying to get rid of some of these departmental boundaries by really focusing on like kind, of, like kind people doing the same thing across government rather than in silos. Right, let me open it up to questions. Um, I know a number of people want to ask questions. I, I will start here, then move, move back. Um, Andrew. Very unusually, very unusually um, it, it, the, the departmental boards have had a framework which you've set out, it's unusual for boards to have a framework, and then have been evaluated in total uh, by, by you. Um, so they do have a structure of, of evaluation, but you pointed out, of course, that it remains very difficult to assess how successful boards are. Yes. Um, you've given some additional criteria, as you were, to, to think about. What do you think about the idea of individual boards setting more precise targets for themselves each year, for them as a board to see how well they're doing, and then at the end of it to evaluate it? So um, 
one of our principal advisors in, there, in this area has been Tracy Long, uh, who has spent many, many years looking at board effectiveness. A and uh, so that's exactly where the boards have got to, not all of them at once. It's, um, I think you start with a bigger framework, then you ask the boards by dialogue to assess themselves against that and then to come up with the next framework, which is more bespoke. And as a result, we've, we have, uh, for example, set aside formulaic box ticking as the way of uh, testing boards. We, we're much more descriptive, much more dialogue-oriented uh, board evaluation. I think, Andrew, it's very difficult, though, to say, you know, we saved a billion pounds and the boards did it. They didn't. They absolutely didn't. Uh, the executives did that. Right. Um, just one there and here, and then we'll, I'll, I'll move further down and across. I'm Dougal Goodman from the Foundation for Science and Technology. Early on in your speech, you talked about a shift away from process and a focus on results. But then later on, you talk about the importance of risk management. Often a board is focused on stopping something happening, not making something happen. And the only way to do that is by focusing on the process. I think, Dougal, uh, good boards uh, take a point, let me say. Uh, I think uh, risk is not an excuse uh, to avoid. You have to actually go and get risk but what you need to do is know how much you've got. It's, it's like anything, it's like how much return do you have. Is, you know, if it's satis in, in business, the amount of return is irrelevant if you know, unless you know how much risk you've taken on to do it. So it's, it's about measuring and understanding the risk with your eyes open. And then I think you can look at whether what is being asked for or being attempted is reasonable. You know, You've got resources and time, both are finite. Uh, you've got an objective, and then you've got risk. So all of those have to speak to each other. It's not absent, and this is not process. This is substance, I believe. It's the action. It's part of. It's really is part of the result. Risk is part of the result. It's not part of the process. There are plenty of processes needed to get there, some of which are very undesirable and and shouldn't be used, which is making lists of risks and hoping that you've just got them all documented rather than actually thinking about what you should really do with understanding the risk you're undertaking. Ben Walker, um, Professional Manager Magazine. At the start of your speech, you said that there was a dissonance between what chief executives said and what they did in regard to seeing their people as the assets and thinking their priority is to develop those people. Do you think they really believe what they said? And if they do, why aren't they doing it? So I, I believe that, I mean, I've not come across a chief executive that doesn't genuinely believe that people are, are her or his most important asset. The problem is time allocation. So I think, I haven't seen the analysis, when they, if they sat down, as I used to do in BP, and I always criticise myself, I still do it in all the jobs I do at the moment. I, you know, the question is, how much time are you spending on things you say you're doing. And so the words like, people are my most important asset, means that I am going to spend my most important time doing that, which usually means most of it, or half of it, or at least the time at the beginning of the day, rather than just before I leave the office in the evening, tired and exhausted. So very few people really speak to that because there are plenty of other things that they're required to do and they haven't been able to shift those to other people. But I do think time allocation, single most important thing, the chief executives, therefore permanent secretaries, therefore everybody really in any position of authority needs to work on. How much time do they spend? What do they do? It's usually a big surprise when they do it. Thanks. Um, and one long here. Andrew, then we'll move back, yeah. Andrew Kahn, a governor here at the Institute for Government. Uh, can I, first of all, John, say that it's a thankless task being a volunteer in Whitehall, um, but as a civil servant, I thought that people like you did a wonderful job, and, and <coughs> you won't get the thanks you deserve, but, but you should. Um, you quoted Peter Hennessy as saying that the high point of civil service capability um, and achievement, and perhaps reform, was during the Second World War when all sorts of people were brought in. And you quoted not only um, uh, uh, business folk, 
but also academics, engineers, scientists. Do you think the, your choice of NEDs for departmental boards reflects the breadth of talent that there is around, or is it too focused on business folk? And do you think that we, there ought to be outsiders on lower boards in departments? Because many departments now have boards, they're quite they're not real boards, but they're called boards for divisions or sections within departments. I think uh, what we've reflected in the first CADA is a very broad cross-section of leaders of uh, FTSE 100 companies and very significant uh, third sector organizations. Uh, because the principal thing we were looking for was an understanding of scale. Because I think, you know, if there's one thing you've really got to understand is, it, as Peter said, it, and as, with apologies to David, but well, actually, well, no, because it's not a corner grocery store. It's many of them all operating together with one supply chain. So we were looking primarily for that. And I think we've caught quite a few skills as a result of that. Do I think, and actually well, quite a few skills, including scientists and engineers, as well as business people, as well as uh, commentators from the media. Now, I think it needs to be broadened out in the future. And I agree with the smaller boards. Just remember that when you incorporate the, um, the arm's length bodies, uh, Andrew, it's quite a gigantic number of people. There are many, many uh, arm's length bodies, all of whom have boards. And are frequently in this building. Uh, uh, behind. And then. Good afternoon. I'm Lucy Slinger. I work for Shell. Uh, I'm a finance manager in Shell. And I recently joined the um, audit committee of DFID um, as a non-executive <laughs> member of the audit committee. So my question is really for some personal help um, on my side, and, and I'm sure you have a sense of this, but I'm always challenging myself, how do I... I want to bring the expertise and the learnings that I have from the private sector, but I don't want to be in every meeting saying, well, in Shell we do this, and in the private sector we do this. So. What, in your experience, is the best way to bring that into the room? Well, I wouldn't restrain yourself too much, but, <laughs> I'd, uh, I'd, uh, but I, wouldn't, I wouldn't become a bore on it, you know. But you're there because Shell does some great things, and you may as well say, you know, we do it this way because it's effective, and, uh, you know, and, and, and I'm trying to understand why you do it another way, you know. And you may learn something as well. You may actually take something home. Uh, because not everything is right in any company. Uh, but I think it's important not to be shy to say, well, I'm bringing different experience, and then have a debate. But ask it in an inquiring way to make sure you, you may learn something. And there are some good things going on. David. Uh, David Walker, Guardian Public. Uh, Andrew Lickerman just asked you a question. Andrew was till recently chair of the board of the National Audit Office. Isn't it a fair test of the emancipation uh, of NEDs in Whitehall from departmentalism that they would have made more common cause with both the NAO in its investigations and with the PAC. And I know you may have conversations with the chair of the PAC, but that's not a substitute for uh, an articulated relationship between the body which is principally concerned with greater efficiency in Whitehall and NEDs whose interests, as you indicated, were, was, were both efficiency and pushing against the departmentalism, which is often, PAC evidence suggests, right. any evidence suggests, the enemy of better effectiveness. So, uh, several things. First is, the, N the NEDs did meet as a, a collective, uh, met several times a year. The Leeds met as a collective with the permanent secretaries, uh, at least once a year. Uh, so there were many uh, uh, possibilities of cross-learning. Secondly, the leads have now been called in front of the PAC for the first time. And I think they are pretty clear in that they're quite uh, open about what they say. They're, 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 if I may say so, less briefed than some of the officials, uh, which uh, I think is, uh, is, a, is a good sign. Whether there's uh, more to be done, I think there always is. Uh, but there's a limit to the number of times we can bring together people as a collective, given their time schedules. But it's not bad. It's better than nothing. Yeah, could I also say, anyone in the joining room um, wants to ask a question, please come to the door. There's a gentleman at the back. 
Roger Goss, BP pensioner and co-director of Patient Concern, a troublemaker on behalf of patients. You mentioned the importance of good management information to effective government. What do you see as the criteria for trading that off against people's right to privacy? For example, patients' most sensitive secrets. Um, so, uh, if I may say so, fortunately, this is not an area I had to go down because we were more interested in aggregate information rather than individual records. Uh, and so I think that's, uh, I could leave it there. I might just add, it seems to me very important that you get as much information as you can in one place uh, when you want to do anything with anybody. Uh, the key is how do you protect it? And that's something which is a very big debate right around the world at the moment. I think uh, I was uh, worrying about this in quite a different environment to do with leaders of organizations um, and their private lives. And I've now concluded that actually when you're a leader, you've probably inherited, you've actually signed a, a hidden statement which says, I have no privacy while I'm a leader. A and that's part of the job nowadays. Uh, Sue Street, a non-executive director at the Ministry of Justice, and I echo what Andrew said about our oh, thanks to you for what you've done. Uh, we have about 97 days till the election. Uh, I'm pretty sure the Cabinet Office guidance will be non-executive directors should clear their minds and not think anything at all until uh, whatever administration comes in. It's slightly unrealistic. There are commercial and operational and, and contractual and other priorities and constraints, H how do you suggest we prepare ourselves to make a really constructive impact after the election? Um, well, I think things will go on, obviously they do, and I hope officials will carry those on, and I hope they'll, I think, I don't know what the guidance is, because uh, it's after my time, uh, but I very much hope the guidance will allow for consultation with uh, non-executive directors, both from the existing administration and opposition. Uh, because I think there's quite a lot of learning uh, which is independent and not specific to a particular political bias. Uh, I think that's quite important. Maybe it could be confined to the lead directors, otherwise things go out of control. But I think there's quite a lot of learning here that I hope will be picked up by whoever's in charge. What would your, just taking forward Sue's point, and uh, one or two people from um, involved in um, with the main opposition party here today. What would be your main advice to them, apart from the general points you made at the end of the speech, in relation to the role of NEDS, which is, after all, has changed since, since many were in government, even though it's only you know, nearly five well, years? I think the single most important thing for all parties to okay. say uh, is that they would value this type of activity, and they would value and respect the people involved in it. Because I think the moment, if anyone uh, sent out a signal saying, well, this is all nonsense, I guarantee everyone would find something better to do very quickly. And you'd lose it. You'd lose all the people. Because this is not something which is a job. It's a, it's a vocation. And vocations need encouragement. And, and I hope very much that that happens. Right. No, the, uh, thanks, Lauren. Keith Davis from the National Audit Office. It kind of picks up on what David Walker was saying a little bit. I'm not saying that just because he so generously name-checked us. Um, so it's a point about integration and Ned's contribution to that. So you know, if one of the big challenges in government is getting departments to integrate more effectively, whether it's finance functions or whether it's delivering services, uh, local growth, etc., is most of the Neds are contributing at the moment through departmental boards. So in a sense, inevitably, their sphere of interest kind of gravitates towards that departmental sphere of interest. It's just really whether you think that's the best, whether they're able to have an effective influence on that sort of need for integration and to get departments working together effectively, or whether there's <coughs> other structures or other ways of doing well, that. It's not quite right. Uh, actually, the, the, the Neds are involved in the functional activity as well. So, for example, 
uh, the newly formulated uh, finance uh, uh, management board is full of nets as well as uh, operating, uh, as well as uh, finance directors. So I'd like to see more of that happen. And I think it's certainly the, the, uh, the efficiency and refor re reform group had a lot of NEDs actually in its uh, original formulation or in the subsets to do with IT, MI, things like that. And most of that came out of uh, some of the findings of the NAO, of course, uh, which were uh, reasonably, reasonably well uh, uh, circulated to most NEDs. I, I think more can be done, there's no doubt, but at least there's a, a start here. We wait for the, for the mic. Thank, thanks. Okay. Thanks, Peter. Uh, Matthew Trimming, I advise uh, suppliers into uh, government and also do some advisory work for the National Audit Office. Um, you praised uh, the role that uh, Francis Maud has played in this. How important after May is it for uh, someone of that sort of weight and longevity to be in that role in the cabinet office to instantiate the, uh, uh, well, your change not rolling back, I suppose. Well, I'm, you know, I, I will have to say this because I believe it, is that uh, very large organisations should be independent of personalities. Uh, and uh, the real test is whether or not it carries on uh, with a change of face, maybe several changes of face. Uh, I think that... Uh, some of this, and that's, that I think requires everyone to work at it. Uh, it's been kicked off, there's been a particularly hands-on minister, uh, and uh, so, you know, maybe another minister will not be as hands-on. Uh, but it shouldn't change uh, what's going on. Uh, inevitably things, you know, always self-correct, but I hope the key themes uh, are maintained in place. Uh, Jonathan Slater, Ministry of Defence, um, where the reforms I've um, been lucky enough to be leading for the last three and a half years have been hugely enhanced by the departmental board model uh, that you've been describing, as the Defence Secretary said this morning. Um, you, you talked about your, your, your ambition for further civil service reform, and you mentioned um, the policy delivery divide, the importance of the working you know, closely together. Do you think the way that we talk about a policy profession and a delivery profession within Whitehall is a good thing or a bad thing? You know, good so long as the two understand each other, or, or bad because it gets in the way. And if one other quick question, you talk about the importance of a finance community working across departmental boundaries. Do you think we should be reviewing the way that the Treasury bilaterally negotiates with each of us on our budgets, or that it's, um, <laughs> or that that's not a significant blocker of this cross-departmental finance profession you aim for? I've always been told that the question someone asks you as you're leaving the room is the question to avoid. <laughs> uh, uh, I think on the first, uh, it's very much like, I remember when I, in BP, there used to be a divide between technical people and people who really did good work. <laughs> uh, you know, because the technical people did the work anyway, but the people who did politics and commerce were very important, and there was a divide. And actually it was very unhealthy, and the divide was cleared up a lot by stopping language being abused that way. So I think I would try and eliminate the language, because the reality is policy's no good unless you've thought through delivery given the resources and time available, and delivery is no good unless it's speaking to policy. And they're one and the same thing. And the sooner we just get rid of this divide, the better. Because uh, it, it also sets, somehow policy seems smarter and more high class, and delivery seems a bit grubby and lower class. Uh, and there's that sort of rather bad divide as a result of that. And it's just not true. I think I've spent a lot of my life in delivery and I feel good about that because that's what business does. Um, the organization of the Treasury is a topic that you need to take on with uh, Nick McPherson, I think. Uh, I think it's very important that government that there, there is a central controlling function in government. There has to be, uh, and there are very few of them. Uh, and that's one of them. Quite how that works with the bilateral negotiation and how that can be made 
uh, perhaps uh, less confrontational, more effective, uh, I, I remains to be seen. I, I don't have a clear answer to it. Uh, even in business, I may say, the controlling function of finance very often has to put the final touches to capital and resource allocation between divisions, and it's never a pleasant sight. <laughs> right, two, uh, two final questions. Gentleman down there, Julian. Hello, Chris Gallagher, SAS UK. Um, you've obviously seen government from the vantage of someone who's come in from the world of business. And I'm curious to ask, do you think we'll ever get to the stage where ambitious civil servants can take several periods throughout their career, moving into academia or into the corporate world, coming in and out, um, and without missing out on opportunities to get to the top, either the permanent secretary positions? Well, I mean, I think the most obvious example is Jeremy Hayward. So he went out and went into banking and then came back in, uh, which is no bad thing. Uh, and, uh, and I think he would say, you have to ask him whether he thought it was a good idea, but I, th I think everything he's told me, he learned a tremendous amount. Uh, there are plenty of civil servants at all different levels. I, someone came to see me yet the other day who's just about to go into the senior civil service, who is going to take two years out and is trying to define what they're going to do. I think all of that is great, uh, and the civil service should do, it, do this sort of thing. I think maybe it could do it the other way around as well. Uh, you know, having people in, they'll learn something uh, about different forms of organization. They really will. And that used to happen in the past, of course. Um, all of this seemed to have stopped, and a little bit of actually behavioral archaeology wouldn't be a bad thing, We'd, but give it in modern context. Um, Julian McRae from the Institute for Government. Um, John, you talked a lot about the, if you like, the governance structures around departments themselves, um, uh, you know, the boards themselves, but also the assessment of permanent secretaries, uh, something we've talked quite a bit about here. I was just wondering, going on from that and possibly touching on part of Jonathan's question, what about the responsibilities of the centre of government itself? We have the Cabinet Office and Treasury, indeed, number 10, which are often institutions which you get grumblings from departments about how they are asking for things or acting in ways that are not particularly helpful uh, in any meaningful sense. And this can go on for years and years. What mechanism should we have in place to make sure that the things that have to be done centrally are done really well and those who are in charge of them are helped, supported, and challenged to make sure that they are doing them better year on year? So I, I think I'd say that there's no right or wrong model for what a, a central set of functions should do, except for the fact that they are a central set of functions. Uh, because the standards, as it were, and high-level appointments need to be made in one place, and indeed resources, which are very scarce, so it's people or money, have to be controlled somewhere where someone can ration them, because uh, they can't be automatically controlled. So those seem to be the functions of the center uh, uh, above all else, uh, and naturally also monitoring and uh, audit and what have you. So assembling that, there are plenty of choices. Some of it, some of it's in place, not all of it by any means. And I think uh, in order to achieve the tests I laid out, I think we have to go further in defining more clearly what are the centralizing functions, functions, uh, not necessarily uh, line decisions, but functions. Just following on for that as a final question, John, one change we've had in the, in the period um, has been, of course, in the civil service leadership. Um, we now have chief executive of the civil service, um, from a colleague of yours. I mean, to what extent does that achieve some points that Julian's raised about functional leadership. Some. Because, he, because he's not really a chief executive, but certainly the way you were at BP or anything no. like that. No. I mean, uh, the, the chief executive of the civil service mm -hmm. has control of some of the functions, quite a few of the important ones. It now needs to be worked at to make sure that all the behavior of all the people in the departments is in line with that. That's a big part of the center very big part of the centre. The other, of course, is the finance controlling functions. Very important indeed. Right, well, thank you very much indeed. It's been an absolutely fascinating um, hour uh, for your valedictory remarks, um, although I 
Um, I, I don't think we've heard the last of your, your thoughts on government in, in any way at all. Um, uh, um, there are lots of um, I issues still around, which I'm sure you'll wish to comment on in future. But thank you for actually contributing to the Institute in Speeches um, um, while you've been the government's lead, Ned. And thank you very much for coming today, despite your uh, robocop uh, uh, cop injury. And thank you to the audience for some very stimulating questions on that. Um, and we, indeed, on Monday, we will have uh, John Manzoni talking, um, um, uh, and we're also going to be live streaming it as well, um, talking about his role as chief executive. So there's a, there's a continuum we're having on that. So um, could you join me in thanking uh, John Brown for coming here today and for such a fascinating uh, discussion of his role? Thank you. Thank you.